Okay, this is the Brabazon Lecture, and it's an annual lecture held, um, held uh, on air transport issues by the Society. And it's in honour of Lord Brabazon, who was an early aviation pioneer, um, and in fact he was the first Englishman to fly an aircraft on English soil. And later became Minister of Transport and uh, Minister for Aircraft Production during the Second World War. Um, and I think it's relevant today because he was a great innovator. And I think one of the uh, aspects of the, certainly the Northern Runway and some of the challenges that aviation faces with net zero and so on is that it requires innovation in order to move forward. So, um, as I say, we're looking forward to what, what, what Stuart and, and Tim say today. Just some brief background details about, about Stuart and Tim. Well, Stuart is the CEO of Gatwick Airport. Um, he previously worked in several positions with BAA, including Managing Director at Stansted and other airports. Um, Tim um, is planning, well, Chief Planning Officer um, and also has worked in uh, various positions with BAA and also EDI Energy. And he's also worked for local government and in consultancy. Um, right, well, I now hand you hand over to who's speaking first. Uh, it looks like looks like Tim. No, right, okay. We always like to offer uh, excellent value when you come to Gatwick. So tonight you've got two for the price of one. Um, it's our pleasure to be here. Uh, Tim and I thought we'd uh, present uh, together uh, uh, for the Brabazon uh, lecture. Um, and uh, certainly I think uh, if you've been in my shoes or Tim's shoes over the last several years, uh, some of that pioneering spirit and resilience of uh, Brabazon um, is something that you've, uh, you've needed to, uh, to get through, uh, well, particularly uh, the impacts of uh, the pandemic uh, and then the subsequent uh, build back uh, to, the, uh, to the passenger volumes. Um, what we're going to do uh, this evening is uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Gatwick as a business. Um, um, I'll talk a little bit, bit about some of the impacts uh, of COVID, first of all, and the impacts it had on our company. Um, but I'll not use slides to do that because I think we really need to move on uh, from that time if we can as quickly as possible. So the slides I'll present will talk more about our recovery and particularly uh, the here and now. Um, then I'll hand across to, uh, to Tim. Uh, Tim and I have uh, worked together for um, a large number of years, uh, both at Gatwick, but also earlier uh, in our careers at, uh, at Stansted. And uh, Tim will present uh, to you um, the plans that we are progressing uh, for the routine use of our existing uh, Northern Runway. So there'll really be uh, two aspects to, uh, to the uh, discussion this evening. Um, and then after that, we're very happy to take uh, any questions uh, from the floor um, or even just to, uh, to share insights uh, with you. So please don't be shy in uh, asking us questions uh, if you have some. Um, so if I just start uh, in terms of uh, uh, the journey that we went through uh, with, uh, with COVID. Um, you know, back in uh, 2019, uh, for ourselves and for the airlines uh, operating uh, at Gatwick, uh, you know, we really were going gangbusters and we'd had about uh, 10 years uh, of continuous uh, growth. Uh, we'd gone from around about 31 million passengers back in 2010 uh, to 46 and a half million passengers choosing to use the airlines and the airport uh, in 2019. And I see we've got Douglas uh, Mule in the, uh, the audience who uh, at the time was a, a big part of heading up the, uh, the EasyJet operations uh, at the airport and it was a really vibrant, uh, busy uh, busy airport with uh, you know, lots of investment uh, happening uh, in the facilities and lots of passengers <coughs> going through the airport uh, throughout the year. It was a really exciting place to, uh, to work. Uh, then, of course, um, along came uh, the pandemic uh, in early 2020, and we vividly remember uh, going from record-breaking uh, volumes in about week three of March of that year uh, to by the time we got to um, er early to mid-April, practically having no passengers whatsoever, uh, which was uh, you know, perhaps one of the most uh, demoralizing and uh, 
challenging things that could possibly happen to you if you worked within our industry. Uh, but of course, we knew we couldn't run away with away from that. We had to uh, uh, somehow uh, contend with it and uh, and deal with the uh, the challenges that that put in our way. Uh, to give you sort of some numbers around it from a Gatwick perspective, um, as we uh, went through uh, 2020, we saw about 10 and a half million passengers uh, use the airport. Uh, Nine million of those passengers came through uh, before the end of March. And then one and a half million passengers came through uh, during the last uh, nine months. So there were some spits and sp starts where it felt as though things might get going, but it was sort of really a series of false starts. As we got into 2021, I think, uh, you know, not just at Galway, but all airports, you know, we're feeling quite uh, optimistic. Uh, and then regrettably on the 4th of January, um, things closed down even more so. Um, and in the first six months of 2021, uh, we saw about 500,000 passengers go through the airport. Whereas ordinarily, we'd see about 160,000 passengers travel through the airport per day. Um, so it gives you an idea of the, uh, the impact uh, that it had on the airport. In the second half of uh, 2021, uh, we saw about 6 million passengers. So we got to about a million passengers per month um, uh, traveling through the airport. And it really wasn't until we got into uh, to last year, 2022, uh, that fortunately, with the uh, uh, vaccinations being rolled out um, and uh, with the um, slot utilization rules coming back into force and with the travel restrictions starting to fall away, uh, that we really started to see um, you know, the airport uh, change gears and the airlines change gears and the ramp up uh, started uh, last year. Um, as the airport business over those two years of 2020 and 2021, um, I think our net losses were about 880 million pounds. So it gives you sort of an idea as to the scale of the impacts. Um, and we had to turn off our CapEx programs where previously we've been investing at about 230 million pounds a year. Um, I think at one stage we got that down to about a million pounds uh, of investment per month for several months. So it gives you an idea of uh, some of the actions uh, that we had to take uh, to survive. Um, and we also had to go to the markets once we could see that the uh, business was starting to recover uh, to refinance those losses. Uh, so we borrowed about uh, 750 million uh, pounds of uh, debt that we uh, hadn't anticipated having to borrow during this period of time. Uh, but the good news is, uh, as we got into 2022, so the recovery started. Um, in terms of uh, Gatwick, uh, one of the things we've done in 2023, because uh, this is really where I'm going to sort of pick up the story on the slides, uh, is that uh, as we got into 2023, on the back of 33 million passengers last year, uh, and on the back of uh, an EBITDA performance, which is our measure of profitability of about 450 million pounds, <coughs> so our confidence has uh, very quickly started to return uh, to the business. And one of the things uh, that we did earlier this year is to uh, rebrand the airport. Uh, so you can see up on the screen here uh, the, uh, the new brand identity uh, that we're rolling out. It will probably take us about a year and a half to two years to complete this. Uh, but for those of you who travel through Gatwick, as you start to come through, increasingly you'll start to see uh, this new very sharp and clear uh, branding used across the airport um, and a particular emphasis on the London Gatwick and just making it crystal clear uh, where we are, particularly for when we're marketing ourselves uh, to the longer haul airlines. Um, what you'll see uh, in terms of our vision is that uh, as we've come out of COVID, uh, what we really want to be is an airport for everyone, uh, whatever your journey. And the reason we say that is because of the variety of different airlines that we have at Gatwick. Uh, you know, we have a variety of uh, ultra low cost airlines, low cost airlines, and then the full service carriers. Uh, and we want to, to cater for each one of those different uh, airlines. Um, in terms of the, uh, the traffic recovery uh, in 2023, uh, this slide uh, starts to show you uh, how things really have started to pick up. Uh, so you can see uh, behind me, I'll actually stand on one side so it's easier. Uh, on the uh, bottom left hand side, it's the passengers uh, by hall. By hall. Uh, so you can see that the domestic uh, traffic really has started to recover uh, quite significantly uh, versus where we were in 2019. Um, on the uh, short haul of the European travel, it's pretty much repaired itself uh, to uh, very nearly 100% uh, recovery. 
And certainly a number of our airlines are above 100% of the volumes that they were doing on the European networks uh, in 2019. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see that we're still making steady progress uh, in uh, recovering uh, the long-haul traffic uh, at the airport. First six months of this year, we had about 60% of the, uh, the long-haul passengers that we would have seen in the first six months of 2019. And we know as we go through this year with the route launches, that will continue to, uh, to get stronger. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see uh, uh, month by month the, uh, the traffic progress. Um, and you can see that uh, certainly one of the uh, after effects of COVID is that whilst we're very busy in the peak summer months, certainly our shoulder months are a little bit slower to recover. Uh, so certainly that'll be a, a focus area for us uh, in the years ahead. And then you can see on the top right of this slide uh, that when we look at the passenger volumes for 2023, clearly we're getting towards the end of the year, uh, we're expecting to uh, be on or around 41 million passengers traveling through the airport compared to 33 million last year and six and a half million the year before. Um, and that's around about, well, just, just shy of a 90% recovery on 2019. Uh, so that's the, uh, the state of the nation uh, uh, in terms of the traffic uh, recovery. Um, in terms of long haul, uh, one of the things which is very important uh, to us uh, is that we continue to develop this business. Uh, the reason it's important to the airport is because we like competition and choice. So we like to offer as many different airlines to as many different destinations as possible uh, and obviously the uh, long haul routings are very lucrative, not only for the airline, uh, but also for the airport and for the surrounding economy, uh, which <coughs> in which the, uh, the airport uh, resides. Um, the good news is this year already we've got 50 different long haul routes uh, on sale. Some of these routes will launch uh, in the next uh, several weeks. Uh, but you can see along the bottom of this chart, um, a whole raft of, uh, of different uh, long haul airlines operating to and from Gatwick. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, in the blue, some of the, uh, the uh, newer long-haul airlines that we've attracted uh, during the course of uh, this year. So the likes of uh, Ethiopian, uh, Air China, Air India, uh, for the first time in my time at Gatwick. I've been at Gatwick for 14 years, so that's a, a real coup. China, Eastern, Saudi, Air Mauritius, uh, and Delta uh, to complement uh, the existing long-haul uh, airlines. So it's a, it's a key focus for us. Uh, we think we should be able to grow this uh, uh, long-haul network further. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we had over 60 different uh, long-haul routes, so uh, certainly that's what I'm focused on, and that's what the, uh, the commercial team at the airport is uh, focused on. And of course, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things we know about long-haul is, uh, not only do you get the economic activity at both sides of the route, uh, but when you do get the long-haul, you also get the flow of cargo, um, so it's incredibly uh, important. Um, of course, uh, I thought Peter might have mentioned this in his opening comments uh, about Brabison. Uh, does anybody know what the uh, first cargo flight was? Apart from Tim. <laughs> of course, you should know. It was a pig. So Brabison, for a joke, had heard that, uh, you know, wood pigs fly. And uh, <laughs> what he did was he got a basket with a piglet in it, stuck it on the side of his plane in the very early years of aviation, and off they went, and that was the first recorded cargo flight uh, in the world. Um, now in terms of uh, Gatwick, getting back to the, uh, uh, the nitty gritty, uh, one of the things very important to us, of course, is service delivery. Um, and uh, at the airport, what we have are a range of uh, service level agreements. We call them core service standards, uh, which are agreed between the airport um, and the airlines. Uh, so each month there are 46 uh, different things that are measured across the airfield and in the two terminals uh, at Gatwick. So this would include things like uh, cleanliness, availabilities of seats, uh, the, uh, do the air jetties work, does the fixed electrical ground power work for the uh, aeroplanes, um, are the travel aiders, the lifts, the escalators working, how long do you have to wait to get through security? Uh, so there's 46 different measures, quite a comprehensive uh, list of measures. And uh, this is essentially our scorecard uh, for this year. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, from a security queuing point of view, uh, on the bottom left-hand side, I'm pleased to say that in the first six months of 2023, uh, nearly 98% of passengers got through the security area in less than five minutes. And the great news is 99.9% .9 of passengers got through in less than 15. So that's uh, amongst one of the best performances 
that you would find in, uh, in a European airport. And you can see uh, in 2019 and 2022, you know, we're pretty good at this stuff. We've got a strong track record uh, in the security performance at the airport. On the uh, right hand side, uh, this is just looking at those 46 measures and essentially uh, marking down to say in the dark blue, this is where we've been successful. Uh, you can see that uh, during the course of 2022, as we were ramping back up, we did have a number of core service standard misses. Uh, but in uh, 2023, so far year to date, we've had just one uh, in the first half of the year out of 276 different measures. And that's about as good as it gets from a, a core service standard point of view at the airport. So you know, the team are very, very focused on offering uh, great service. And this is really on the service that the airport directly uh, delivers. Uh, of course, there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, so the other thing that we are also working on um, is driving up our airfield performance. Um, and there are really um, several things at play here. So on the left-hand side, you know, as we went into this year, what we did as the airport was we put into uh, effect a lot of work uh, making sure that the airfield post-COVID was in as good a condition as it could possibly be. Uh, so last year we resurfaced the main runway. Um, that's quite a major undertaking. It's done during the night. And it means that the main runway at Gatwick currently is in about as good a condition as it could possibly be. Um, it's got a life uh, span of about 10 years before it needs to be surfaced, resurfaced again. What we also made sure was that all of the piers and all of the stands and all of the facilities were also um, serviceable and available to the airlines. Um, and we also, believe it or not, uh, increased the resilience of the air traffic control tower uh, working with NATS uh, by adding an additional five controllers versus where we were last year. Now, of course, there may be questions about NATS, which maybe we can uh, save till later. But nonetheless, just bear in mind, NATS actually have added additional controllers into the tower. Happy to take questions on NATS. Um, in terms of uh, some of the uh, challenges that we and the airlines have faced uh, during the first part of the year, a lot of the challenges have been around air traffic. So we have heard about some of the challenges of the tower, but it's also the challenges of the airspace across Europe. And particularly in the first six months, there was a lot of industrial action in France, uh, which was meaning for some of the routings going from Gatwick, uh, inevitably some of the, uh, the routings were picking up uh, delays. And also with the uh, conflict in Ukraine, very regrettable, uh, it does mean that a lot of the air traffic has concentrated into the western part of Europe, uh, which is certainly uh, giving us challenges uh, when we have such a such a high propensity of our flights going to and from uh, Europe. Uh, nevertheless, what we have done is set up a task force. Uh, it's the airport, it's the airlines, it's NATS, and it's uh, Eurocontrol, all working together uh, to try to, uh, to figure out what actions we can take uh, in order to, uh, to continue to drive this performance up, particularly ahead of the summer season next year. Uh, back to the airport. Uh, just to sort of give you a snapshot of the, uh, the bounce back, uh, because I talked to you about the losses and the impacts of COVID. Um, on this slide, you can see uh, just how dramatically uh, the revenues have started to uh, flow into the airport. Uh, so this is looking at the uh, first six months of the year, comparing us to uh, 2022. And you can see that uh, whether it be the aeronautical charges uh, from the, uh, the airlines, whether it be the retail, the car parking, um, or the other uh, income lines, there really has been uh, a, a really significant uh, uptick uh, in the way in which the, uh, the airport is financially generating uh, revenues um, and therefore our uh, profitability. Um, in terms of looking uh, more to the, uh, the future and our investment, um, as we start to get back to normal, uh, so we start to consult uh, with our airlines and also with what we call our passenger advisory group. Uh, so these are volunteers who uh, uh, put in a lot of effort to, uh, to represent the interests of passengers uh, at the airport. So on the left-hand side of this chart, uh, you can see uh, the capital investment program at Gatwick. We consulted on this in the earlier part of the year. Uh, following that consultation, it was finalized and uh, published. So it's available uh, on our website. Um, in the middle of this chart, you can see uh, the total capex, capital investment spend uh, which we anticipate uh, putting into uh, the airport uh, infrastructure. Uh, so you can see that uh, next year in 2024, 
uh, we'll be back to about £200 million pounds, uh, of investment uh, at the airport. This year we'll invest about £160 million. Pounds. And then you can see in the years ahead, uh, once Tim successfully gets the planning permission for the routine use of the Northern Runway, uh, our investment could be as high as nearly half a billion pounds uh, per year uh, towards the, uh, the end of the decade. In terms of some of the projects that we're working on currently, uh, on the bottom of the chart, uh, you can actually see the, uh, uh, the bridge, uh, the Pier 6 bridge. Uh, you can see in the, uh, the lighter grey, uh, the existing uh, Pier 6. And then to the bottom left of the picture, uh, you can see what we call the Pier 6 extension. Uh, so this is a project which uh, is worth over £200 million. And uh, it was paused during COVID, uh, but we're now finalising the, uh, the detailed design. Uh, and we anticipate delivering that project uh, by 2026. The key benefit is it will give uh, the airlines that operate out of the north terminal, uh, particularly EasyJet actually in the early hours, um, an additional eight uh, A321 peer served gates. It's quite a significant project. Uh, on the bottom right of this chart, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the work that we're doing on our new rapid exit taxiway. It's shown here uh, in the, uh, the red. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is to uh, put in a new taxiway slightly further down the runway uh, because over the years as the planes that use Gatwick have got slightly bigger uh, what we tend to find is uh, the taxiway that we currently have been using is, is no longer in the optimal position. Uh, so by putting the, uh, the taxiway slightly further down the runway uh, it means that uh, as the planes lose energy when they land they'll lose energy at the right point where they can exit at a higher speed still safely doing that uh, rather than uh, today, sometimes they miss the first taxiway and then they trundle down the runway, occupying the runway, which is something that we'd much prefer that they didn't do. Uh, that project uh, is about £30 million. Pounds. It's currently on site. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, by the end of this year, that taxiway, or the rapid exit taxiway, will be uh, in beneficial use uh, to the airlines. Uh, so that will be good uh, from a resilience point of view and in the future from a cap capacity perspective. And then finally, uh, to the top right, for anybody who has been uh, uh, frequenting Gatwick uh, over the period of COVID uh, <coughs> and more recently, uh, it's just an image of uh, the uh, upgraded rail station. Uh, so we uh, partnered with Network Rail. Uh, there's about just over £40 million pounds of investment from the airport going into this project. Uh, it was important for us to do <coughs> that uh, because uh, when we put that money in, we also attracted £10 million pounds from the local enterprise partnership um, and that managed to persuade the DFT and Network Rail to go ahead and uh, upgrade the rail station at Gatwick. Uh, this project was on site right the way through COVID and uh, in November time uh, we're expecting to see the, uh, the grand opening of the, uh, of the rail station. Um, it'll involve uh, a doubling of the uh, concourse size uh, of the rail station. Uh, we're already in the oyster zone so if you're traveling in and out of London you can go contactless. Uh, it gives better vertical circulation to the platforms and some of the platforms have been widened uh, and passengers will uh, enjoy uh, going onto the platforms uh, in positions where it makes it easier to utilize the 12 car trains uh, that we now, in, that we now uh, uh, see operating to and from the station. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the key features of Gatwick is the fact that we are adjacent to the Brighton Main Line and that means that we have uh, trains going in the direction of London once every three minutes either to London Bridge uh, or to Victoria, and nowadays actually through London uh, with direct connections to Bedford, uh, across to Peterborough, and also uh, Cambridge. So the rail connections to Gatwick are, are second to none. Uh, other things that we're doing um, is refreshing the North Terminal Departure Lounge. Uh, so if you do go through the uh, North Terminal this winter, I apologize, there will be uh, some hoarding up, there'll be some works happening, uh, because we're replacing all of the floor, um, and we're uh, basically uh, modernizing the appearance uh, of the, uh, the North Terminal Departure Lounge. As passengers, uh, you should start to see <coughs> a big difference uh, by about Easter time of next year. And these are just some of the, uh, the new brands, uh, just a couple of examples. There's many, many new brands, particularly on the food and beverage, that we've launched at Gatwick as we've come out of the COVID period. Uh, and finally for myself, before I hand across uh, to Tim, um, another really important area for us 
uh, is the work that we're doing uh, on the uh, sustainability uh, front because we recognize uh, that we uh, really do have to continue to uh, maximize our efforts uh, from a sustainability perspective. So this is by no means um, uh, covering all of the activities that we do at the airport, but it just gives you a flavor uh, of some of the things which I'm pleased to say are now very much alive at the airport. Now, one of the things from a people and communities perspective that myself and the teams are very passionate about uh, is really talking about the virtues of STEM skills, uh, which are very, very useful uh, right across all of the disciplines uh, of the airport. Uh, so we continue to do a variety of, uh, of programs and schemes that enable us and people who work at the airport to share uh, our careers um, and our experiences and our educational backgrounds uh, into classrooms of children uh, from maybe uh, 12 or 13 uh, through to 18 to try to encourage them uh, to at least consider uh, the benefits of, uh, of the STEM skills. In 2023, uh, already, uh, we've turned back on uh, our graduate programs at the airport. Uh, so in uh, uh, September time, we saw our first graduate intake uh, following uh, COVID. I'm really proud to say that during COVID, every year we continue to take in our technical apprentices. Um, and we've done that for over 40 years continuously at Gatwick. And COVID certainly didn't stop us uh, from doing that. Um, on the right hand side, uh, just a couple of things in terms of uh, our environmental uh, performance. Uh, we won one of the uh, coveted awards uh, at the ACI uh, Europe, it's the Airport Council's uh, Europe uh, event earlier in the year. And that was really celebrating our work on biodiversity uh, at the airport, where we're recognized to be possibly the leading airport uh, in Europe. Um, and one of the things that we have done this year is to uh, partner uh, with some of our local uh, communities uh, in, in uh, sharing any deodorants or uh, products that we, uh, we collect through the security area so that these things don't just go to waste. And then in the middle of the slide, uh, there's our biggest announcement, which is around our scope one and scope two emissions. In March of this year, um, we committed to get our scope one and scope two emissions uh, at the airport uh, to net zero and uh, to do that in 2030 or by 2030. Uh, as opposed to uh, our previous commitment, which was 2040. Um, we haven't just done that on a whim. Uh, during the COVID years, we uh, worked in quite some detail uh, looking at what causes the emissions. And we know that we've got to change the way in which we <coughs> heat the airport, refrigerate the airport, uh, and the vehicle fleet that we use at the airport if we're to achieve this objective. Uh, once we've invested about 250 million pounds, we will achieve net zero, and we'll do that by 2030, which means it will be the most advanced of the large UK airports by a number of years. Um, so I think that sort of gives you a good feel for, um, as we come out of COVID, we're starting to fire on all cylinders uh, again. So with that, I'll uh, hand across to uh, Tim, who will talk to you about the Northern Runway project. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Stuart. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Uh, so, first of all, I was going to give you uh, a quick overview of the Northern Runway Project. We call it the Northern Runway Project, but it is certainly more than just a runway. Uh, and then, um, this is an important time, uh, period of time for the project, uh, and it's really great to be able to explain to you why it's an important time, because, uh, as many of you may know, we're going through a, a comprehensive planning process. Uh, and the planning process is just about to, uh, to start and this is your opportunity to get involved in the planning process if you've got any views or want to address any comments to the inspectors who are going to uh, examine this planning application. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I've got, basically this is the only slide I've got some text on. Uh, most of my slides are pictures, so that's because I'm a planner and I really only deal with pictures. But, um, if you fly out of um, Gatwick, you'll realize that actually there are already two runways at Gatwick. Uh, we've got the main runway, which you can see in the image in blue. Um, but just to the north of that, separated at the moment by 198 meters, we've got an existing, what we call the emergency or the standby runway. Now this standby runway was actually constructed 
in the early 80s. And it formed part of a 40-year agreement that was signed back in 1979 between the then British Airports Authority with the local pl uh, planning authority at West Sussex. And that planning agreement signed back in 1979 said Gatwick would not use that runway for 40 years. Now obviously that agreement expired in 2019. So what Gatwick did is it honoured that agreement for the full 40 years. But after the airport's commission process back in 2015, where the government decided that the next new runway for the southeast should be at Heathrow, we started to look and do a number of studies to say, well, actually, we've got an existing runway. How can we operate that? And so picking up on the other strand of government policy, the main strand of that government policy is to make best use of your existing facilities, make best use of your existing runways. Now, as I said, that these two runways are currently separated by 198 metres. 198 metres. But to meet the ICAO standard to operate two runways independently, you need to get to 210 metres separation. So you're just 12 metres short at the moment. So essentially what the planning application does, it extends, it puts a strip along the side of the, the pink runway and it moves the centre line 12 metres. And then you can start operating these two runways uh, together. But what that means is you have to shift a bit of the airfield, you have to shift some of the taxiways, and that 12 metres doesn't seem a lot, but it has some knock-on consequences. Now, in terms of the concept of operation, it's fairly simple operation. We will continue to use the existing runway as we use it today for all departures and all um, takeoffs. So you've got all of, all of your, you've got a number of arrivals coming through on your main runway and your departures also on the main runway. But as Stuart sort of alluded to, when, a, when we've got an arrival coming in and it's, go, it's under control and it's going down the runway, the main runway, that is effectively um, dead time. That runway is not in use because it's got the plane on it. But what we can do is we can get a plane ready on the northern runway and we can that allow that to take off. So this northern runway project is only used for departing aircraft. And it's traditionally the departing aircraft which would be the sort of the traditional A321s, the A320s, A319s or the Boeing 737. The majority of our flights doing those sort of short European types of destinations. And by doing that, you can then drive up the capacity of the airport so that instead of doing 55 movements an hour, you can then start to build it up using departures interspersed with the arrivals. So you can move it up to about 69 movements in an hour. And then if you look at the calculation, what that means is from where we are, we can move up to about 380,000 movements a year throughput. And that will get us to a passenger throughput of about 75 million passengers by 2038. Now the benefits of this scheme, as I said, is to make best use of the existing infrastructure. But it's not just about the runway. There is a lot of development that needs to accompany the project. As I've talked about the passenger numbers increasing, we need to do extensions both to our north terminal and to our south terminal. We would need to develop a new pier, Pier 7, that long thin blue strip at the northwestern edge. We would need to do quite a bit of work to the taxi configuration to make sure the holds were all correct and that there's, uh, it's as safe uh, and meets the ICAO standards. And then obviously with an airport, you need to have other airport and aviation related facilities like your cargo facilities, <coughs> office accommodation, hotel accommodation, 
and all the things that make an airport run as we know today. So that's just the, the pictorial. That's a bit more detail, uh, but what we have to do is everything shunts about 12 metres to the north. So some facilities have got to be uh, replaced, uh, some have got to be moved, and then we've got to introduce some new facilities as well. But effectively, in order to meet the numbers of passengers, we need to do extensions to the north and south terminal and, as I say, the new pier. But all of the works for this scheme on the airfield are within the airport boundary. So we're not taking people's land outside the airport boundary for the airport works. We're not demolishing properties or houses or residential properties. And we can absolutely be in line with government policy uh, to make best use of our existing infrastructure. But obviously you need to get to the airport as well. So in order to get to the airport, we're looking at how to improve the surface access arrangements. Now approximately today about 90%, just over 90% of our traffic, our surface access car vehicle traffic, comes to the airport along the M23. So what we're doing is looking at to improve the access arrangements into the airport by creating a flyover for the south terminal roundabout and creating a new geometry and a flyover for the north terminal roundabout as well. <coughs> and then there's a local improvement on one of the local roads at Longbridge roundabout to improve the geometry of that roundabout as well. So these all form part of what we call the project. The main element of the project is to increase the capacity, but also we want to try and increase the resilience of the airport as well, which is vitally important. We know that there's been no um, real increase in capacity in the London system since the 1950s, really. There's ne never been a new runway in the, in the southeast since the 1950s. So this is a scheme that we developed in order to improve capacity at the airport, but also to increase the resilience of the airport as well. Now, as I say, we were very fortunate that the, the board and our shareholders, this is a, a project that I started back in 2018, actually. Um, so um, I guess I've been a bit slow at my work, um, but I didn't really uh, anticipate at that stage um, a two-year delay brought about by COVID. But the shareholders kept faith in the airport and in the team to continue and to allow us to prepare the planning application. And because we're classified as a, a piece of national infrastructure, uh, this planning application, it was submitted in July, and that goes to the government's planning inspectorate. And they are an independent panel of examiners that will scrutinize every single aspect of this application. Now, some people will have very, very strong views about the application. Some people will be in support. And a lot of the business community, a lot of the people who rely on jobs, people who, a lot of people who fly from the airport, whether that's for business or whether for uh, leisure or just simply to visit family and friends, actually are very supportive of what we're doing to try and increase the capacity. But there are some people who are not so supportive and who object to the application because they're concerned about environmental issues, in particular noise and climate change. So what the planning process does, it allows that debate, that examination, that review to happen fully with full transparency uh, in a public forum to test the proposals. And so in July, we submitted our planning application, about 30,000 pages um, altogether contained within about 300 separate documents. The planning inspectorate uh, looked at it for 28 days, went through all of the documents, and decided that it passed the test for acceptance. So when, then we moved into the next phase, which is what we call the pre-examination phase. So all of our documents are on the planning inspectorate's website. Um, and that's just one of the uh, documents there. The, all got the, uh, they're all numbered and they all 
uh, are linked into the examination library now. And because we uh, got accepted, we're now what we call in the pre-examination phase. And it, why I thought it was important to come today is because the pre-examination phase lasts until the 29th of October. And if anybody has a view about this proposal, anybody wants to support it, or wants to put in a comment about it, the registration process is open until the 29th of October. And this is people's opportunity to what we call register as an interested party. And what that allows the inspectorate to do is, when people have registered and they put their views across, the inspectorate will gather all of those views and they will decide on what the principal issues are that will be uh, open for the examination. And the examination is likely to take place in the first half of next year. That'll be a six-month inquiry process of people, five panel members examining the application. And they will cover every single issue that has been raised by those uh, relevant representations. So as I say, this is a process that has been long in the making. It started back in 2018, 2019. We had two rounds of consultation in 2021 and 2022. We've submitted our application in 2023. And we're in this, what we call stage three at the moment. Now we really, we know that the roughly the examination timetable will be published in the next month or so, next couple of months. And then that will allow, if you've registered, allow people the opportunity to speak at the hearings at the beginning of 2024. And then there is a stage where the inspectors will make a recommendation to the Secretary of State for Transport. And then the Secretary of State for Transport, under the Act, has three months to make a decision on whether to approve our application or not. So they take all of the evidence into account and then they decide on the merits of the application whether to approve. And we believe that, will, that decision will be towards the end of 2024. Now, as Stuart says, if, we're, if I've done my job correctly, then we will then start the process of construction and delivery. Uh, a lot of these works would take place at night because we still have to maintain the operation of the runway during the day. So we would hope that we'd be having the first flights on the 12 meter shifted runway by the end of the decade. Now there's a lot of work to go through, a lot of debate to be had. Uh, as Stuart has said, some of the environmental issues will be hotly contested, uh, certainly on carbon and climate change around our commitments to become a net zero airport by 2030, but how we reduce aviation's overall emissions by the introduction of sustainable aviation fuels, by working with the likes of Airbus and Rolls-Royce to look at the future generation of aircraft, hydrogen aircraft or electric aircraft, but also the things that we can do today around modifying the airspace so that we can fly more direct, more efficient routings. So there's a lot of work being done in this space to help the aviation sector meet its climate uh, commitments. So I'll just leave you with this image um, of the airport. What always strikes me about Gatwick is, and as Stuart sort of mentioned, um, it's a great exciting place <coughs> to work. It's got a great range of airlines, it's got a great range of destinations, and if we can allow a few more destinations to be served by this project, allow a few more people to, to fly in a sustainable way, and if we can compete, because we're not the only airport that is looking to expand, other airports are doing that as well. And one of the things I think Lord Brabazon would have said is, you can't just stand still. You've got to look at efficiency, you've got to be pioneering, you've got to look at innovation. And what I hope I've demonstrated through this project is that's exactly what we're trying to do this month and into the future. Thank you very much.
Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Stuart and Tim. A very, very interesting lecture. Um, now, we have some time for questions. Um, I've got a couple of questions myself, and then we'll hand over to other people. Um, just quickly, my, my questions are these. I'm interested to know why Gatwick had an emergency runway in the first place. <laughs> I mean, why, why, I mean, most single runway airports don't have emergency runways. Why, why did Gatwick have, have an emergency runway? I think I should ask Stuart to answer. He's a bit older than me, so he might remember. <laughs> um, and my, my second question is looking at the CapEx spend. I um, mean, you showed a, on a slide which showed that you were going to significantly increase your CapEx in 2026 and 2027. Now, some of that will go on the Northern Runway, um, but I'm interested to know what other projects you have in mind, you know, during those years. Well, why don't I answer the difficult question, which is the second one, Tim, and you can answer that first one. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the CapEx spend, there's a whole variety of different projects that we, uh, uh, that we uh, have in mind. Um, you know, fundamentally, we've got to maintain the, uh, uh, the asset uh, in the first instance. So uh, we have uh, what we call um, an asset replacement spend, and that means that uh, routinely, year in, year out, uh, we're out and about on the airfield, generally in the spring or in the autumn time, uh, looking at different uh, areas of uh, the taxiway facilities uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we're always keeping the asset uh, uh, in very good condition. Um, so, you know, you'll see us sort of doing routine maintenance such as that on the airfield or also in the terminal buildings. Yeah. Uh, other things that you'll uh, uh, see us doing uh, over the next uh, uh, 12 months uh, will be uh, the construction of a new multi-storey car park in the North Terminal. It's got 3,700 spaces. Uh, it'll open in the, in the autumn time of next year. It's already past the, uh, the foundation uh, phase. Um, you'll see us uh, uh, build a PS6 project that I showed you, uh, which will provide uh, eight additional PS stands. Um, but as you start to move into uh, the mid-2020s, so you'll start to see us uh, expand both of the departure lounges. So one of the things that we know to support both the northern uh, runway project, but also to support the airport as it currently is, is that we need to add additional uh, footprint uh, to both of the departure lounges. Uh, so they're quite significant uh, projects uh, that are undertaken, um, and they rely on the successful planning application uh, that Tim's leading for the northern runway. Um, you'll also see uh, next year uh, the next generation security uh, go into both terminals. Uh, so by uh, um, probably about this time next year, uh, we'll be well on the way to uh, all passengers being able to uh, leave laptops, liquids and gels uh, in bags. Uh, our first lanes uh, were installed as trial lanes uh, just over a year ago. We've had about two million uh, bags through one of those lanes. Uh, so we're uh, confident of the design of the lane that we've got and we're now going to roll that out uh, over the winter period. I think the first installations of the new lanes will take place probably around Christmas time. Uh, so that's a big project uh, for the airport from a security perspective, but also from a passenger service perspective. So that just gives you an idea of, uh, you know, a, a taste of a number of the different projects uh, that we'll do. And then, of course, if we're successful uh, on this uh, planning application, then there'll be lots of work out on the airfield uh, with the various different uh, taxiway uh, modifications. So um, I wasn't around in 1979 when the... Um, when I guess the planning permission was granted for that uh, standby runway. You were around. Well, 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 well not at Gatwick, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're at school. Um, and um, I, I guess um, uh, the decision was taken by the British Airports Authority in those days that they would um, build a, what they called the emergency runway, um, effectively so that they <laughs> could allow maintenance to take place on the main runway and not... Uh, reduce capacity or affect the operation uh, of the airport. Um, but I think at that stage the local authorities were concerned that they would use it together as a, uh, as a runway. So that's why they entered into the 40-year agreement uh, not to use it simultaneously. So um, Gatwick honoured that 40-year agreement all the way through the lifetime. Um, and today the, 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 the sort of the northern runway is effectively used as a taxiway more than anything, um, just to allow aircraft to get to the hold points on, on the main runway. So um, it, it does serve a, a, a purpose. 
Um, but that's why, as I showed on one of those diagrams, there is quite a bit <coughs> of um, airfield work that's needed to support the northern runway to make it work efficiently uh, to get the uh, levels of capacity throughput that we're uh, anticipating. Okay, uh, over there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure the economic case for this is, is, is very strong. I mean, it's massively cheaper than a third runway uh, at, at Heathrow. But what about the climate impact? You know, the Climate Change Committee, the UK government's Climate Change Committee, I thought they said no airport expansion. Um, how, how are you going to get around that? So I'll talk about the economic case, Tim, and then do you want to talk about the, uh, the expansion? Because there is expansion happening elsewhere uh, as well as Gatwick. So in terms of the, uh, if you look at the, um, the capital investment uh, that we're talking about uh, to achieve the additional peak hour movements that Tim mentioned, I think you said, Tim, we'd go from 55 movements uh, per hour uh, up to about 69 yep. to 70, somewhere of that order of magnitude. And the way that uh, I would sort of see that commercially for the airlines uh, is that in the peak hours, you go from 55 uh, to around about 70 in each of the peak hours. And that will be the first time that you've had uh, a tranche of peak hour slots available to airlines to travel to and from uh, London and the South East for many, many years. Um, so it's a really quite uh, significant um, uh, release of slots. Uh, and very, very attractive uh, slots. Now, to, uh, to achieve this in terms of investment, um, the incremental investment uh, associated with the Northern Runway project, including all of the ancillary uh, aspects, uh, some of that being the road networks that Tim, uh, Tim mentioned about, uh, will be about £2.2 .2 billion. Pounds. Um, so on the one hand, that might seem like an awful lot of money, uh, but if you compare it to either the full new runway that we ourselves put forward to the Davis Commission in the 2010s, you're probably looking at about 8 to £10 billion pounds for that project. Um, and if you compare it to the Heathrow schemes, it's, it's difficult to know what the number is at the moment because they're not really working uh, uh, on it as far as we're aware. But certainly the sort of scale of the order of magnitude would be sort of £20 billion pounds or maybe even more. So the £2 billion pounds is an incredibly um, efficient use of capex. What, why, is the, uh, why is there such a difference? I think, Tim, you actually mentioned it in your presentation. <coughs> what we're really talking about doing here is maximising the use of the existing uh, airport infrastructure. There's not big land acquisition, so we don't need to go and uh, buy acres of land to the south of the airport going into the Manor Royal Industrial Estate. Uh, all of the airfield works are actually done on the land that we already own. That's why there's no compulsory purchase order of anybody's house or, or business. Um, the runway already materially exists. We do need to put a strip of uh, material to the north, 12 metres, to move the centre line. Uh, but effectively, we're doing building works on the land that we already, uh, we already own. Um, a big part of the expenditure actually is on the road networks that uh, Tim talked about, which is part of our mitigation strategy. Uh, those road network uh, improvements will probably cost around about £300 million. Um, <coughs> if we put our scheme together, uh, nothing is uncosted. So we've said we'll foot the bill for that um, as part of the £2.2 .2 billion upgrade. Um, there's no modifications required to the M23 uh, or to the railway line. So it gives you an idea as to uh, why we can do it so cost effectively. Um, at the moment, our airport charges are about £12 per passenger uh, on average. Uh, comparing to, uh, to Heathrow's charges, which are somewhere of the order of 25 to 30 pounds, around about that level. Um, and we see no reason why we can't do this scale of investment um, and still keep our uh, airport charges at a really competitive level, particularly compared to, uh, to Heathrow, and therefore be attractive to, uh, to airlines to come in and, and use the facility. So that's the sort of commercial aspects of it. And in terms of um, carbon and climate change, I guess that's probably one of the questions I get asked the most. Um, and um, so uh, I usually deal with it. Um, there's, there's what the airport can do itself. So that's what we call the scope one and two. And we've got a, a program, as Stuart says, of a £250 million programme 
which is the small stuff, but you've still got to do it. Um, so that is to replace all of our boilers, to move all of our fleet to electric vehicles, and to um, remove refrigerants from our buildings. But you're right, the bigger challenge is the scope three, the global emissions. Uh, and for that, the government have got um, a document called their Jet Zero Strategy. And the government are confident that all of the measures in that Jet Zero Strategy will enable the aviation industry to get to net zero by 2050. And the, the aviation industry, the coalition of um, sustainable aviation group, has committed to achieving that goal. And you do that through the measures I, I, I talked about. So probably the most likely to come forward, first of all, and we've already um, had flights with sustainable aviation fuel at Gatwick. Um, this is a fuel that is 70% on average, uh, less emissions than the <coughs> traditional kerosene that's used in, in aircraft. Um, and we know that the government have a, a program to have five SAF plants ready by 2025 and are looking at a mandate to um, encourage airlines to uh, have a certain percentage in the, uh, of their fuel to be SAF uh, by 2030. But you look at the other measures that are needed as well, airspace modernization, uh, certainly that's achievable uh, and that's a program that's undergoing uh, substantial work at the moment. But then there's all the uh, innovation in um, the aerospace industry uh, through the ATI uh, around the introduction of electric and hydrogen fueled uh, aircraft. Now that may be some way off, it may be the 2030s, the 2040s, but what we're doing is the government have put a program in place to invest in that now so that the, the technology and the institutes and the universities uh, can look at and, and have got funding uh, to look at the ways in which we can uh, introduce uh, hydrogen or electric aircraft. Okay, uh, Malcolm. Thank you, Malcolm Ginsburg, Travel News Update. Uh, at the end of the day, your bread and butter is actually the airlines. I think you've, at the moment, 10 down on routes from pre-COVID. Uh, uh, that's one. And can you tell me if you're getting on with uh, Virgin, who, of course, started <laughs> at uh, Gatwick with a 747-200, which struggled to get out the runway, as I recall. So could you update that? I think you've got uh, Delta in now, their, their effective owner. Um, so, yeah, so we're working really hard uh, from an airline perspective, Mark. I couldn't agree... Uh, uh, more with you. I mean, the airlines are incredibly uh, important uh, to the success of, uh, of the airport and, and the regional economies. Um, as we've gone through uh, the recovery from COVID, uh, one of the pivotal moments uh, for us uh, was the British Airways decision uh, to not only uh, remain with the long haul flights at Gatwick, which was, it was clear all the way through COVID that that would happen, uh, but it was when uh, British uh, Airways committed to bring back the uh, short haul fleet. Uh, so that happened uh, in the spring of last year. Um, EasyJet uh, actually acquired uh, more slots during the COVID period. Uh, so they've got about 80 based aircraft at Gatwick uh, uh, this summer, which is phenomenal. Um, and then many of the other airlines uh, who were flying to Gatwick uh, returned and started operations. Some of the areas where there was change was Norwegian. Uh, so on the one hand, we saw Norwegian retract back to just doing uh, short haul flying from Scandinavia out of Scandinavia. So we do still see Norwegian at Gatwick, which is great, uh, but it's a way based aircraft uh, flying in um, and they haven't made any moves to go back to, to long haul flying as yet. Um, but we did see a new Norwegian airline called Norse uh, emerge. Uh, they're actually flying uh, about uh, a fleet of around about nine or ten. Uh, Dreamliners uh, and from Gatwick they're flying quite a few of the uh, old Norwegian long-haul routes uh, which is uh, is good to see um, and the other change was Virgin so Virgin uh, uh, retreated back to, uh, to Heathrow um, and other than Delta coming in and obviously there's a close relationship uh, with Virgin as yet we haven't managed ver to persuade Virgin uh, to restart operations at, at Gatwick but one thing's for certain we're in a constant dialogue with Shai and uh, his team 
and they're very welcome back uh, at the earliest opportunity. Case, case. Uh, uh, Keith Manns, former CEO of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, you'll be pleased I'm not going to ask you about air traffic controllers. <laughs> <laughs> someone else will sooner or later. Um, when I was running the society, I was also advising the SBAC on government affairs. And one of the things I used to tell the board is the importance of taking into account the political clock when you've got a major project. So I just wondered whether you'd taken into account that the, the, the decision on your runway, uh, 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 well, your new runway, is going to be right in the middle of the election campaign, whether that's sensible and whether you should be thinking about doing something about it. And then a very quick supplementary question about the, um, the facilities you're adding as a result of the extra runway with the extra pier. I wasn't clear how passengers got from that pier oh, to the yeah. terminal. Question. Why don't I take the first question, Tim? You take the second one? Yep. Um, so just in terms of the, uh, the point around the uh, political clock, this is something which we did consider um, with our shareholder board. And uh, I suppose the conclusion that we came to was that uh, the policy which um, Gatwick is uh, seeking to get the permission under is the sort of tried and tested formula of governments of, of any colour in recent decades, which generally speaking, have all centred around making the best use of the existing uh, infrastructure. That's fundamentally what we're trying to do. It's very, very similar to what uh, Stansted have done uh, recently by having their cap uh, increase from 35 million passengers to 43, or Luton are doing with their plans, which are probably about three or four months ahead of us, uh, going through a DCO application, uh, or for that, that matter, the work that Bristol Airport did uh, recently. Um, so when we uh, weighed up the pros and cons of uh, do we uh, try to uh, estimate as best as we can when an election will be and what the mood of one party or the other might be, um, we sort of came to the conclusion that we were ready. Um, we think the merits of our case are strong. And if we look at history, um, <coughs> governments of either leaning have always endorsed packages uh, which maximise the use of the existing facilities and therefore we took the decision to press ahead uh, to make the submission earlier this year cognizant of the fact that it's likely that there'll be an election next year it's not clear whether it could be in the springtime or more likely I think people think in the autumn time but nevertheless we decided to press ahead and because of the uh, uh, fixed timing nature of the DCO application it does indeed mean uh, that this is likely to be on the Secretary of State's desk probably in quarter four of next year or around the turn of next year. Um, and uh, the die is now cast. Uh, so we're sort of past the point of no return from our perspective. But we did consider it. And, and generally, both parties are very keen on supporting national infrastructure. Uh, so as Stuart says, it's a privately financed project, uh, private investment, uh, and the, the economic benefits to the local economy, the local region, are significant. It's 14,000 additional jobs uh, and at least a billion pounds uh, of value add into the economy every year. So the economic benefits of this project are, are significant uh, and the, um, the cost would not fall on the taxpayer and the environmental impacts we believe can be uh, appropriately and uh, mitigated and, and managed. Uh, in terms of the Pier 7, that would be uh, accessed via a, a sort of a guided bus type of system from the North Terminal. One more? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've probably got time for probably a couple more quick questions. Um, chap here. My name's Alice Hughes, I'm a passenger. A uh, quick one, um, 200, me 200 metres is just a round number, isn't it? Why not challenge that, given particularly that you're limiting the size of the planes and you can decide when they leave and make sure that they're not actually parallel with anything on the other runway? Or in terms of the width of the runways, you mean, Alistair? 
the spaces. The separation. Yeah. So this is something which, uh, again, we uh, considered at the inception of the project. So Tim and I have both worked on this yeah. uh, literally from, uh, from day one. Um, and when we sat and uh, we considered the, uh, the project, uh, because there are well-established uh, global ICAO safety rules, in our deliberations, one of the things we did consider was, should we challenge the rules as you've as you suggested? I think if I remember right, Tim, the, uh, the rules uh, are sort of historic rules and they relate to uh, veer off of aeroplanes. And uh, the idea of the spacing back in the day was that uh, the planes wouldn't veer off at the same time and collide with one another. Uh, so there is, a, there is a plausible argument that says, well, with the technology that you use today, it's very, very rare indeed for a plane to veer off a runway, and it's virtually inconceivable that you could have two planes uh, veer off uh, two runways at the same time. Uh, but nevertheless, the conclusion that we came to was that within our industry, trying to get the rules changed would probably take longer than just putting on the strip of additional material to the northern runway and meeting the rules. So that's where we uh, landed on, we'll just uh, conform to the rules and uh, make the safety arguments very, very straightforward. Um, last one, yeah. Uh, Alan Marega, a fellow of the society. Uh, my question is on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, just to understand if there's any extras provisions and uh, planning for the storage and distribution of SAF at the airport. So uh, the good news is that we've already done a, a, a test, a pilot, uh, using our existing network, our existing infrastructure, and we can accommodate the sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, it's a mix, it's a blend, using the, uh, blended with the existing fuel today. Uh, and that can be uh, used in our uh, current pipelines uh, to go directly from the uh, storage farm straight into the um, wings of the aircraft. So there's no new infrastructure that's needed. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, we, we've already had a number of flights uh, with um, EasyJet, uh, who uh, had about 40 flights going up to Glasgow for COP26 uh, with a 30% uh, SAF mix and that was sort of what we call a proof of concept trial to make sure it worked. So we're confident that the existing infrastructure in and around the airport can accommodate uh, the sustainable aviation fuel. I think at the moment um, the regulations are only uh, allow um, a 50% mix of sustainable aviation fuel to be utilised to uh, today. Uh, I know that there are several uh, test flights uh, being undertaken um, largely with military aircraft actually, uh, to look at um, getting the uh, mix to 80% sustainable aviation fuel and then there's uh, a flight which will have 100% sustainable aviation fuel. So, um, so that it's constantly um, being uh, progressed uh, uh, and, and looked at uh, today. Okay, I think we better draw things to a close, unfortunately, because it's go on for a, a long time on this, but um, I'd like to thank both Tim and Stuart for a very interesting and um, lecture, learnt a lot, and wish them every success with the Northern Runway project. Um, it's, it's going to be quite a long haul, I think, but, but good luck with it. Um, and I'd also like to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Um, there are lots of events going on at the Royal Aeronautical Society, so look at the website and just come along, register for, for an event. So hopefully see you next time. Thanks a lot.